Es que ricasco gorrocha te guira caslea. Nos hace especial ilusión recibir a nuestra siguiente invitada, ya que no es la primera vez que tenemos el honor de recibirla en Passion for Knowledge. Se trata de Jocelyn Bell Barnell, la, la descubridora del Pulsar. No sé si se han fijado, pero esta imagen, la del Pulsar, es eh, la, que representa, la imagen que representa el festival de este año. Hemos querido que esta imagen esté en todos los rincones de Donostia. En 1967, Bell descubrió una, seña, una serie de señales de ondas de radio extremadamente regulares a las que por aquel entonces llamaron LGM, Little Green Men, en referencia a la remota posibilidad de que fueran intentos de comunicación de vida extraterrestre. Finalmente, se descubrió que provenían de estrellas de neutrones y fueron bautizadas como pulsares. Aurkin Kunza, científico Rec. Milla Beratzi, un tarío que atamalauco, física con Nobel Saria, Jaso Zuen. Naise ta aitorza ezen belentzatizan. Gero bimilla ta emes orcian, breakthrough Saria, Jaso Zuen, bere carpen científico en gatik, eta diru osoa, eman zuen, emakume eta minoriak, fisik, eta minoriek, física y casteco, aukera izan de zaten. Gaurkoan, Pedro Miguel Echenique, Donostia International Physics Center eco presidentea, que el carriz que tatuco du, Jocelyn Bell Barnell. Eman diez a llegó un guía chalo vero batekin. Pues buenas tardes a todos buenas y a todas. Buenas tardes, Jocelyn. Buenas tardes. Primero explicar brevísimamente por qué esta vez hemos hecho un nuevo formato. Normalmente Jocelyn participa en nuestros eventos. Las charlas que dan son de una claridad, brillantez, que inmediatamente atrapa el interés de la audiencia. Pero esta vez hemos preferido hacer algo distinto, un homenaje a Jocelyn Bell, porque estamos seguros que iba a dar una charla maravillosa, pero cumple 80 años y yo creo que se puede decir, se ha dicho, yo estoy de acuerdo, que quizás haya muy pocas personas vivas, si alguna, que hayan contribuido a la ciencia tanto como a la ciencia en sí, con los pulsares y otras cosas, pero también a la ciencia como cultura, también a las instituciones y también con generosidad a ayudar a científicos jóvenes, especialmente de minorías y mujeres, como yo se Bell. Y por eso hemos querido que el pueblo de San Sebastián conozca la vida de una persona singular, excepcional. Ella es amiga de San Sebastián y ya le conoce todo el mundo. Y de hecho me dicen, Jocelyn, que te han visto por la parte vieja comprando un libro de cómo aprender el euskera en 20 días. ¿No? ¿Es mentira? Como ayer estabas tan entusiasmada siguiendo a los versolaris. El... El premio Breakthrough que se le dio y dedicó en su totalidad 3 millones de euros, el premio con mayor dotación económica, eh, uh -huh. fundamentalmente a las mujeres, ayudar a las mujeres. Eso fue porque en tu vida, en tu proceso, en tu aprendizaje, en tu escuela, en, en, en Irlanda, en Escocia, luego en Cambridge... Sufriste por ser mujer, tuviste dificultades que no debías haber tenido y querías compensar y hacer que otros no tuviesen que pasar por tus problemas. Mm, yes, yes. I, I reckon that uh, a large factor in my work as a graduate student in Cambridge that led to the discovery was because I felt an outsider. I had come from the north and west of the country, not from southeast England, which is the proper part of England. Uh, and uh, I had a, an accent that was really very crude, I think they thought. 
And I quickly realized that uh, I was not an insider there. And I suspected also that they had quickly decided because I was not an insider, I was not intelligent. And so I decided the way I would manage to survive in Cambridge um, for as long as I could, I knew I would not survive very long. I would probably not get my degree, but uh, until they decided I must go, I would work my very hardest. So that when they said, shoo, I would feel I had done the best I could, and I just was not good enough. Antes, <coughs> antes de llegar a Cambridge, también tuviste tus dificultades en los estudios anteriores, suspendiste un examen importante a los 11 años, y eso lleva al peligro de... Eleven. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. al, al, lleva el peligro de eliminar del sistema demasiado pronto, pero afortunadamente tuviste unos padres que no distinguían entre el rosa y el azul y que te permitieron volar y dejar volar tu imaginación. Eso es una suerte dentro de las dificultades, ¿no? I was lucky in my parents, undoubtedly. Um, for example, when I moved into the secondary schooling where you have lots of different subjects and different teachers. Um, the first week, the Wednesday of the first week, a message went round the first year class. This afternoon, boys there, girls there. And I thought, this is sport. It wasn't. That where the boys went was the science lab, That where the girls went was the cookery room. Shocking discrimination. And my parents had told me I would get to do science when I got to the big school. And here I am to learn cookery while the boys learn science. I told my parents that evening, they were oof. They telephoned the local doctor who also had a daughter in the same class, who had been told the same thing. And those parents also, poof, and also a third set of parents. And the head teacher's telephone was quite hot that night. And the next time the science class met, there were three girls and all the boys. And that teacher had never taught girls before. We were dynamite. So if I am the science teacher, he makes us three girls sit here and then all the boys elsewhere because we are going to be trouble. <laughs> But we weren't. ¿Y cómo piensas colaborar o se ha cambiado la situación? Porque ahora la situación es muy diferente. El papel que habéis tenido algunas mujeres siendo referentes, siendo líderes y trabajando para que esto no vuelva a ocurrir. Tú incluso desarrollaste uh -huh. una técnica que consistía en cuando ibas a las clases o a los seminarios y oías las hipótesis iniciales del profesor, al final preguntaba siempre, bueno, y si esa hipótesis no fuese cierto, ¿en qué cambiaría todo? Y claro, con eso te hiciste un sitio y creaste una ola de miedo en los seminarios. <laughs> no, I didn't, because by this time it was Cambridge, and no male in Cambridge is afraid. They are ultimately confident. <laughs> But it was an important question to ask, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, you know, pull the rug underneath. <laughs> oh, el, estamos hablando del síndrome del impostor frente a los a los que has llamado a los arrogantes estudiantes de Cambridge, entre los que me encuentro. El... <risa> Tú te sentías que no valías, sentías que valías menos, y por lo tanto, como conclusión, dijiste, les voy a enseñar, voy a trabajar más fuerte, voy a mostrarles lo que soy. Sí, yes. yeah, Cambridge fue bastante daunting. 
I don't know if in this country you've been aware of our last Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Well, he's from Oxford. He's from Oxford, <laughs> but he's of that generation. Yeah. Infinite self-confidence. Oh, I am right. I am always right. I understand. You know. And Cambridge was full of young men like that. There were very few women, but there were lots of young men who had been at expensive schools and knew it all, and it was so easy, and their professors were just stupid. So, yeah. And I come from the north and west of the country. I have a different accent. I don't have that self-confidence. <laughs> They have made a mistake admitting me. They are going to discover their mistake and will throw me out. But until they throw me out, I will work my very hardest so that when they throw me out, I will know I've done my best. I will not have wasted the opportunity. No guilty conscience. He ¿Crees que eso fue decisivo para el descubrimiento de los púlsares? Porque charlando el día pasado contigo me decías que sobre dos kilómetros y medio de papel las señales estaban ocultas en, en tres milímetros. Y esa determinación que te llevó a ti el síndrome del impostor de demostrar que podías y que ibas a hacer lo mejor de, dar lo mejor de ti, Fue clave para el descubrimiento, esa persistencia y minuciosidad. Yes, I think it was. I think I was being so thorough, so careful, so that I would not have a guilty conscience when they threw me out, <laughs> that I noticed this tiny signal, which I can't explain. But I must explain it. I have to explain it. And I can't explain it. Debió ser duro, ¿no? Pero nunca pensaste en abandonar. I, I, I always wanted to be a radio astronomer. Um, I had originally thought I would go to Jodrell Bank, which is part of the University of Manchester, and I worked there one summer. But I was told that um, the head of the observatory, Sir Bernard Lovell, would not allow a woman, because previously there had been a woman and she and a young man had used the dormitory for a use for which it was not intended. He bragged. Sir Bernard got to hear about it and said, no more women. Interesting which sex pays the price for these mutual encounters. So I didn't think I would be accepted at Jodrell Bank. I would never get into Cambridge. So I go to Australia next January, February. ¿Crees que el síndrome del impostor no es tanto Cambridge o no Cambridge, también como mujer o no mujer? Que la mujer lo tiene más. El no sentirse, sentir que no vale. It's about being a female scientist. And there weren't many female scientists. I did not have many role models. Um, so I'd had no pattern to shape, help shape my career. I was very much on my own. But I wanted to do radio astronomy. <laughs> so you, you enjoy it so much that you fight for it. Yes. Es curioso, yo también creía que el síndrome del impostor lo tienen más las mujeres, pero el, direct, el director del DPC, Ricardo Díaz Muño, que es muy cuidadoso porque nosotros en el DPC queremos cuidar y que a los estudiantes como personas, hemos hecho un estudio y parece que el síndrome del impostor también lo tienen muchos hombres. Y a mí, yo mismo me sorprendí. ¿no? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. El, el premio Nobel, al final... Tengo que preguntarte por el premio Nobel que te habrán preguntado tantas veces, tantas veces, que no te va a venir como ninguna gran sorpresa. ¿no? Gracias a ti, el premio Nobel va por primera vez a astrofísica, pero no te va a ti. Y va 
eh, por el descubrimiento, bueno, por la gastronomía y el descubrimiento de los púlsares. ¿no? El, antes que entrar en sentimiento de culpa o sentimiento de irritación, eh, ¿qué es lo que te parece más interesante de los púlsares? ¿Qué son los púlsares y por qué son interesantes? ¿Y qué has aprendido de los púlsares y qué te queda por aprender? Right. So when a big star reaches the end of its life, because they're burning, they're shining, they're using fuel, and one day the fuel will run out. And if it is a big star, it explodes, except for the core that gets crushed as everything else explodes. And that crushed core becomes one of these neutron stars or pulsars. And all stars are rotating, And if you crush a rotating body, shrink a rotating body, it spins faster. So pulsars are tiny, a radius of 10 kilometers, and they spin very, very fast. They weigh the same as the sun, but all in a 10 kilometer ball. And what is lo que más has aprendido de los pulsares? ¿Qué nos han enseñado los pulsares? Well, they've taught us quite a lot about compressed material, although there's still a lot more work to do on that. Um, but because the pulsar is spinning and spinning very accurately, they're quite good clocks. They go pulse, 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 mm -hmm. forever. And so throughout the galaxy, we have clocks. Pulsars. And that enables us to study the galaxy using these clocks, studying gravity, local gravity, things like that, the way the galaxy rotates and so on. And with time, I think we'll find pulsars in other galaxies. We've not yet got the equipment for that, but it'll come. And so it's telling us quite a lot about galaxies, or at least our galaxy, and the history of our galaxy. En 1974 el premio Nobel va por Radio Astronomía y los pulsares a Sir Martin Ryle y a Tony Hewis. I was a student en el... En el en, I was, en era, era estudiante y no era consciente que, hay, el que la que lo había encontrado era Jocelyn Bell. Figuras prominentes protestaron pero, bueno, podemos decir quién, Fred Hoyle, que ya no está con nosotros, pero uno tenía la sospecha de que protestaban más para herir a los otros que para defender a Jocelyn. Pero sí que hubo, eh, sí que hubo gente que dijo y acuñó el término muy inteligente, que el premio se había convertido en no Bell, no a Bell. ¿Cómo viviste esos tiempos? Sí, yes. sí. Yeah. It was a very special day for me. At that stage, um, I had a job in X-ray astronomy. And you cannot do X-ray astronomy from the Earth because the atmosphere cuts out all the X-rays, which is good for us. But it means to do X-ray astronomy, you have to get a satellite up above. And our satellite was launching that morning. And we came in eight o'clock in the morning We had no video link, but we had an audio link, and we heard the countdown, 10, 9, 8, and then whoosh, and off it goes. And an hour or so later, they are switching the satellite on, and it's going well. And after several orbits, first of all, the programmers say, we must get that program working, the satellite's going to work. And then most of us drifted back to our desks. And a few hours later, at about one minute past midday, a colleague came rushing into my office. Have you heard the news? Have you heard the news? I went, oh, the satellite's gone. <laughs> It wasn't. It was the announcement of the Nobel Prize to Martin Ryle and Tony Hewish. And that particular colleague liked to stir. So he was, you know, keen to see my reaction. But actually, I was pleased because I realized immediately that until then, no Nobel Prize had been given for any topic in astronomy. 
This was the first time there was astronomy recognized by the Nobel Physics Prize. And I knew that other astronomers would follow. So I was really pleased. And he was disappointed that I was pleased. <laughs> Dijiste en algún momento que en aquel momento los premios Nobel no se daban a estudiantes, excepto en aquellas excepcionales circunstancias que eran muy, muy diferentes y que no era tu caso. ¿Esa prudencia o esa humildad la mantendrías ahora? ¿O fuiste cautelosa porque en aquellos momentos podía poner en peligro... Tu, tu trabajly, vamos a decirlo así de brutalmente. Yeah, yeah. I was certainly being as tactful as I could because I did not have a secure job and I could not afford to make the senior astronomers angry. Uh, but I do note that about two or three years later, the Nobel Physics Prize was given for pulsar work Yes. to Joe Taylor and his former grad student, Russell Hulse. They included the grad student. Joe Taylor is a good friend of mine, and he invited me to go to the Nobel Prize ceremony as his guest. And the Nobel Secretariat were <laughs> very anxious, but we behaved. It was good. And it was actually more fun to be there as a guest than a recipient, because when you are receiving the prize, you do this presentation, you do that speech, you meet the king, you do this, you do that, you do the next. And it's very hard work for about 10 days, so don't win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> But, uh, we are trying to encourage, um, every time we meet with the Nobel Prize and the young students, I tell them these are normal persons and if you work like that, you could be like that. I am changing language again. <laughs> He cambiado el idioma. Yeah. Decía que cada vez que me reúno con los estudiantes yes. les digo los no, premios Nobel son personas normales y si trabajáis como ellos, eh, podéis ser como ellos. Y entonces viene Jocelyn Bell y me rompe el argumento y nuestra pasión por Nobles. <risa> ya, ya, ya. En el comunicado de prensa ni siquiera se mencionó, se mencionó a la estudiante. Eso es tremendo. Eso es un... Hay otro caso, muy, dos casos en, en la historia de la física. Una es Madame Wood, de física de partículas, y Lisa Miner. Ahora hemos visto el... Yeah. La película Oppenheimer, en que no va y el propio Fritz. En, en cualquier caso, vamos a olvidarnos, porque gracias a no tener el premio Nobel, Jocelyn, te has convertido en la estrella ausente en el firmamento Nobel y como hay menos, pues eres más conocida. Hay otro aspecto de tu vida, aparte de la enseñanza, que es el aspecto religioso, porque tú eres ferviente practicante, racional practicante, de una religión, los cuáqueros. ¿no? Yes. San Sebastián, la gente no conoce mucho los cuáqueros. Yo, yo sí, porque no. uno de mis mejores profesores de teoría de estado sólido, Volker Heine, era cuáquero. ¿Es distinto los cuáqueros de otra religión? ¿Los científicos, la racionalidad tiene más sitio en esta religión? ¿En los cuáqueros no se, viene, no se os viene dado lo que tenéis que pensar? Mm -hmm. eh, Explícanos un poco en detalle yes. eh, qué es lo que te gusta de los cuáqueros, por qué eres cuáquero y en qué se diferencian los cuáqueros, por ejemplo, en pacifismo. Un poco de detalle, mm -hmm. please. Yeah. So it's part of the Christian church, but it's rather different from almost every other denomination because uh, worshippers are not told what they have to believe you are told to work it out for yourself. And there have been many scientists who have been Quakers. Um, the names you might have heard of, besides the Nobel Prize winner, Joe Taylor for Pulsars, um, Kathleen Lonsdale, Sir Arthur Eddington, were all Quakers. Uh, and because 
you are not told what you have to believe and you are allowed to change your understanding as you grow, I hope, in wisdom. It's a faith that suits many scientists because as scientists, our understanding, we hope, grows and develops with time. So equally, your religious understanding can grow and develop in Quakerism. Te invitan a hablar y dar sermones en el Parlamento escocés, ¿no? Mm -hmm. Yes, I haven't done it yet, but yes, I have been invited. <laughs> at the Scottish Parliament, they have prayers, short prayers, um, not every day, but several days before the Parliament session begins. And uh, they have asked me if I will come and lead the prayers one day. Y ahora te dedicas mucho tiempo a la familia, que también mm -hmm. participan de este ideal, ¿no? Mm -hmm. Y después de porque tienes un hijo, tienes. Eh... I have a son who is also a physicist and collaborates with somebody in the university here, so he knows about Donostia, San Sebastian, and has been. I think to DIPC to visit and, and work. Um, yeah. Uh, my daughter in law is a theologian, and I have two grandsons. So whether they become theologians or physicists or neither, we'll see. What is the difference between theologian and physicist? <laughs> I think there's not a lot of difference. Both are making inquiry. Uh, in slightly different domains, but it's, you know, you are thinking, exploring, wondering, trying to understand. And in, you know, you have worked in many other topics. What is the part of ast astronomy that uh, now uh, interests you more? Ah, perdón, ¿cuál es la parte de la, de la astronomía que te interesa más? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are several areas. Um, one is because as our equipment has got better, we can take shorter exposures, better time resolution. And we find that there are many phenomena in the universe where, you know, suddenly there's a big blast of radio waves and then quiet. And two weeks later, big blast of radio waves from the same spot and then quiet. So we are now able to explore what we call the time domain. We don't have to take these long exposures anymore. And with short exposures, we're discovering a whole range of amazing phenomena. That, I think, is probably the newest and hottest bit of astronomy. But the other thing that has happened is that we have opened a whole new spectrum called gravitational waves or gravitational radiation just in the last few years. And I find that particularly exciting. I was one of the people who believed that there is such a radiation and that we would detect it one day. I was not sure I would still be alive when they detected it, but I am. And lots of fascinating new results coming in there. So to be, see the opening of a whole new spectrum is a real privilege. And ¿cuál es la cosa que de las cosas que sabes que no sabes te gustaría saber? <laughs> Whoa. I think I would like to have better understanding of what gives some of these very short bursts of radio waves or gamma rays or things like that. Um, with our, our better time resolution, we are finding suddenly many, many short duration phenomena. And well, there's rather a flood of it at the moment, which is exciting, but also a little daunting. So um, I hope I'm around long enough to see some better understanding of what gives some of these short bursts. Yes, Maybe. Mm, maybe. Um, neutron stars, I think we have quite a good understanding of what they are made of. 
and we understand how pulsars work, but we find neutron stars in quite a lot of other places as well, and I think we have not yet fully explored or fully understand, understood everything that neutron stars can give us by way of signals. Entre los años 2002 y 2004 fue este presidenta de la Royal Astronomical Society. Creo que también ha sido presidenta del Instituto de Física y también de la Academia de la Academia de Escocia. Este papel institucional eh, es un papel muy dedicado que tiene pocas recompensas. Lo haces como un deber y como contribución a que la ciencia sea más limpia, que cada uno reciba el, el crédito por el que ha hecho, que no se escriba demasiado para que no haya fraude. Hay males en la ciencia. Uh -huh. De hecho, algún, dos personas de esta audiencia, Ignacio Pérez y Sevilla, Joaquín, no sé si es Joaquín o Sevilla, han escrito un libro precioso, Los malos de, males de la ciencia. Yes. Dos o tres males de la ciencia, sí. cuéntanos, en tu opinión, de la ciencia actual. Demasiado competitividad, demasiado uh, deseo de publicar, poco cuidado en comprobar uh -huh. los datos. Passion for publish, no for knowledge. ¿O, yeah. o no? Yeah. Es no, una I, pregunta. I think all of those, every one of them that you mentioned, is an issue or a potential issue. Uh, we are under a lot of pressure to publish. Um, you may not get more money for research unless you publish. So that's not, I mean, it's important that you do publish, but you can be under too much pressure to publish too quickly. And that leads to people taking shortcuts and things like that. So that, that's not, I think, totally good for science. Um, but it's almost inevitable the way science is funded and you know the way the way it works these days that you you have those kinds of pressures uh, and i would hate to be the editor of a journal because you must get a deluge of manuscripts please publish my results please publish please publish it must be shocking <laughs> But sometimes it was a case in Bell Labs with the nanotechnology wonder kid. Sometimes in big collaborations, for example, we have learned the Nobel Prize for Atophysics. Atophysics requires, uh, no, no como física de partículas, pero un inmenso, uh, group, inmensos grupos de colaboradores. Es muy difícil que un teórico pueda saber si el experimento... ¿Es realmente sí. un investigador responsable de sí. todos los contenidos de un artículo? Just about possible in some situations, yes. Uh, you know, a supervisor and a graduate student working together. Oh, yeah. So that will be okay. But if it's a much bigger collaboration involving expensive equipment, facilities that many people use, then it gets much more difficult, yes, to know who to blame and who to credit equally. Yes. It's difficult. In cualquier caso, si está dispuesto a recibir la gloria, tiene que estar dispuesto a recibir la vergüenza, si no es cierto, ¿no? I'd like to think so, yes, but I think maybe there's a little bit of wriggling goes on. <laughs> okay. Una, una, viendo un poco más ligero, ¿qué es lo que hace que una brillante chica de Cambridge acabe en Oxford? Sí, <risa> yeah, bueno, well, Oxford ha sido muy, muy generoso para mí. He tenido muchos trabajos diferentes y recuerdo que en mi último trabajo de pago era dean of a faculty. Is that something you understand in this country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, I was dean of a faculty. Well, in fact, we have many deans. This yes. country just passed in deans. Yes, yeah, but they're very important people. And I, I was not particularly enjoying this job. 
I had time to go to a conference, the International Astronomical Union, which was meeting in Sydney, Australia. Bumped into a former colleague. She said, let's have breakfast together tomorrow. We had breakfast. I said, I think I'm going to retire early. I don't like this job. She took one mouthful of breakfast and said, would you come to Oxford? I said, yeah, of course I would. She had fixed it up by lunchtime from Australia. <laughs> So I went to Oxford. Uh, I'm, you know, a retired person. My pension is my income, so I'm a visiting academic, I think. I have been visiting there for about 15 years now. If you want to come to the IPC, we also take a look at it in a week or in a tarde. Because our ideal is to be easy, easy and easy. But one question that comes a lot of interest and me interests is... ¿Cómo es posible que en una época en que la ciencia ha contribuido a solucionar tantos problemas, a hacer la vida más larga, más agradable, haya estos movimientos anti-ciencia, algunos líderes? ¿Cómo se explica racionalmente esta irracionalidad? No estoy seguro de que haya una explicación racional, pero hago mi mejor para contrarrestarla con meeting with people who have jobs not in science but who are interested in science. For instance, there are many amateur astronomical societies, astronomical yeah. groups, and I regularly go and speak to many of them, so I do a lot of that kind of thing. Uh, partly just to help them see what's happening in professional astronomy, where, where things have got to. But also because a lot of my education was funded by taxpayers. They are taxpayers. That is probably the only way I can pay back the public who have funded me, funded my education, funded my research. So I do a lot of speaking to amateur astronomical societies and, and bodies like that. So education, education of the people is the only way. Mm. Profesor Len, en su brillante charla de ayer, citaba como ejemplo la vacuna. La vacuna que ha salvado millones de vidas. Aquí tuvimos a Oslen Turecki con un guardaespaldas puesto por Alemania. Porque a la vez que en tres meses diseñaron el protocolo para atacar la vacuna, atacar el problema del COVID, con miles de voluntarios, es maravilloso un lado de la moneda, El otro lado es decenas yes. de amenazas. Yes. Oslen Turecki, que ha contribuido a salvar millones de vidas con guardaespaldas en San Sebastián. ¿Cómo se explica esto? No se explica, ¿no? No. I wasn't aware of that, actually, till you just told me, so... We have to... Tenemos que hacer más passion for knowledge, mm. para ver si vamos ganando a la gente. Uy, se me acaba yes. el tiempo, ¿no? Yes. Eh, Undoubtedly. Una, una última solicitud. ¿no? Jocelyn nos ha ayudado, vino a inaugurar una exhibición astronómica que hemos, estamos, hemos inaugurado en Tabacalera. Es una preciosidad, yo no la había visto, me quedé deslumbrado. Por ejemplo, y la explicación de los... Agujeros negros, que es el punto 12, es una maravilla estética conceptualmente. Y hoy, sin embargo, la tecnología, la ciencia básica ha permitido una tecnología que nos permite escuchar el ruido que produjo un choque de agujeros negros hace 2.000 millones de años. Qué maravilla poder escuchar ese ruido. ¿no? Uh -huh con unos sofisticados aparatos, pero no hace falta tanto, porque Jocelyn Bell sabe cantar y silbar ese ruido. ¿Te atreverías? Ok, so when two black holes merge, they start by going slowly, they get closer and go faster. Kepler's law, so it goes... Take a drink of water first. Yes, please. It's a bit faint. Um, the microphone, subirle. 
So it starts low, the two stars orbiting, sorry, orbiting each other slowly. They get closer and go faster. So it goes whoop. And that's the sound that a gravitational wave would make if we could hear it, a chirp. And one of the real delights. <laughs> It's a real, ese ruido no solo nos hace oír los agujeros negros, sino nos reivindica años de ciencia, Newton, la gravitación, la relatividad general, el concepto de agujeros negros, el inmenso trabajo de tecnología para poder eh, medir estas ondas gravitacionales. ¿Cuál es la precisión con la que se mueven? Yes. Es un, un pelo en una distancia de... Explícanos. I'm not sure I know the analogy, the, the figures very well, but they are measuring tiny, tiny movements. They have big masses suspended with mirrors on them and lasers to measure the distance. And when a gravitational wave comes by, they do just a little bit like this. And the laser will see the change. It's, it's fantastic technology, and it's very, very new. It, it's really only in the last few years that we have secure detections. And a lot of people did not believe that this radiation could exist. I've always believed in it. I was not sure I'd live to see it, but yeah. <risa> Cuando en, en esa evolución del universo que nos explicó Jean-Marie Len eh, en 13.800 millones de años hubo un momento que en, hace unos 2.000 millones de años chocaron dos agujeros negros y hoy gracias a Jocelyn Bell lo hemos escuchado Qué fantástico momento gracias al Passion for Knowledge gracias a la pasión por el conocimiento de tanta gente yeah. Y entre ellos, en yeah. una manera muy preeminente, yeah. nuestra amiga. Pero una última pregunta en broma. Dame Jocelyn Bell. Dame. A mí no me, no me suena bien Dame. Sir me suena como serio. Pues no, because, no es porque sea hombre o mujer. ¿A ti te gusta Dame? Sí. Yes. Oh. It... <risa> Pero yo creí que te gustaba más Sir. It's not a terribly nice word. Um, do you have pantomimes here at Christmas time? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So in Britain, in pantomimes, there is a man dressed up as a woman, as a dame, a pantomime dame. And unfortunately, the title dame, as applied to people like me, also suggests pantomime and craziness. And <laughs> y la última pregunta. Has hablado del problema de la ciencia de las mujeres. Hablaste en Inglaterra con la reina de Inglaterra? Uh, you don't get much opportunity to talk to the Queen, just a little bit. And it's fairly, fairly brief. So she says, you are in Oxford. I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> you are a scientist. Yes, ma'am. And then she is shaking your hand and she gently gives a little push as she shakes your hand. <laughs> and you know it's time to <laughs> mil, mil gracias. Thank you, thank you very much, Dame Jocelyn. It has been a privilege and an honor, not only this talk, but all the work, all the help you have given us, you have given the city of San Sebastian, the Basque Country. You are on, honoris causa by the University of the Basque Country. Mm -hmm. It's an honor for our university. It's an honor for the DIPC. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.